Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Friuli, a northeastern Italian region that witnessed in the medieval millennium one of the most interesting cultural intersections um, in, in Europe and that uh, we have only touched here and there indirectly. Last spring I made a video about uh, the, the patriarchate of Aquileia and uh, the the bishopric of Asti in a sort of comparative fashion. Then we have made several videos, as you know, about Longbird history, and you know that Friuli and northeastern Italy, the so called Austria at that time, was essentially the, the area of, of hardest Longbird um, rooting and the one that, that's so important fact, cultural coming back from that Germanic background also in the rest of the Middle Ages. And the history of Friuli is very complex as an imperial land, uh, eventually contended in late medieval times between Venice and, and the Empire, in fact, that bears witness to this very interesting um, political conflict being mostly a frontier area, uh, as, you, as you know, uh, fundamentally between the, the Italic, the Germanic and the Slavic worlds and containing various political entities that today we do not focus specifically on because today's video is yes about the in fact uh, uh, European historical regions but not of a specific polity per se it's about the country of Friuli in general but in fact we will have to make a video about the, the patriarchate of Aquileia specifically but also for example, the, the county of, of Gorizia and other neighbors, the contacts with um, the, uh, the, the Trento area uh, with, with, um, and also with Austria in general, with the southeastern Germanic lands, with, with Tyrol, with the Slavs and with Venice, the Adriatic. So actually, um, too much at a time and I hope to cover all of this in some detail. Uh, at some point I just began also from the Slavic side to talk about Croatia uh, we still have to talk about Slovenia and the mark of Carinthia etc but it's a very delicate and interesting uh, corner of Europe that very often doesn't receive its due um, you know uh, uh, it's attention it's deserved attention as a matter of fact um, so Going really back in time, perhaps unnecessarily, but to make you understand what was with the ethnic background of these areas, this in, in proto-historic times, Friuli was interested by the so-called Castellari culture. Right, the, the region was populated uh, at the end of the fifth century BC, essentially by people of Celtic origin slash influence, in particular the Carni, uh, that also gave the name, as you know, to, to part of the. Uh, surrounding areas and that introduced in the territories the um, they, they occupied and also in the neighboring ones new and advanced techniques of iron and silver working you know from central Europe and thus forming forming um, in, in Roman times what Pliny names as the Carnorum Regio so the region of the Carni. In fact there the area what would have become Friuli was conquered and colonized by the Romans since the second century BC and, and southern Friuli was deeply influenced by the Romano-Italic civilization thanks also to the presence of the important colony of Aquileia and um, as we will see Forum Iuli. In fact, the, uh, speaking specifically about the latter that gives the name to, to, to the region eventually historically the strategic position of this primitive center that already existed as most centers the Romans eventually uh, developed further were, were already there like most of you know communication routes and so on um, led the, the, the Romans to in fact to settle further right to deduct a colony there uh, perhaps founding already in the second century BC a castrum of obvious military nature which was later elevated by Julius Caesar to a forum so a, a market town and for this reason 
the locality took the name of Forum Iuli, so the market of Julius, of, of Caesar, which later became the identifier of Friuli, in fact. And subsequently, the locality was elevated to uh, the municipium status, being ascribed to the Roman tribe Scaptia, and finally risen to the rank of capital of the Regio Decima Venetia at Istria, in the northeast of what would have become, in fact, also the, the Augustan Italy. The other major center in ancient times that would eventually be the sea of the later Patriarchate um, was Aquileia, that uh, also in the last decades of the 3rd century became this, the sea of one of the most prestigious, in fact, bishoprics of the empire already contending in Italy, by the way, at that point, uh, for the second place of importance after Rome, to the same imperial capitals of Milan and sub subsequently of Ravenna. Aquileia had been founded in 181 BC as a colony of Latin law, uh, which essentially indicated its commercial nature by the Roman uh, triumviri Lucius Manlius Acidinus Publius Scipio Nasica and Gaius Flaminius that had been sent by the Senate to block the way to the barbarians who threatened the eastern borders of Italy. Um, and the city essentially grew uh, initially as a military base for campaigns against the eastern, in fact, the eastern peninsula, and against various peoples, including the same aforementioned Carni, uh, and then in later times for the Roman expansion towards the Danube. And Aquileia was essentially an important river port, right? It's closer to the sea. Um, and uh, on, on the, especially on the Natissa River, uh, uh, and as a hub of uh, the Adriatic traffic towards northern Europe, right? Also with the Amber Road fundamentally passing there um, from up, up to the Baltic. And um, it was crossed um, instead latitudinally towards the towards Illyria, right, with, through the so-called Via Julia Augusta, thus owning its importance to a strategically favorable position. Uh, it was not just close to, if not properly on the sea, uh, but it was also near to the Eastern Alps and pre-Alps, so uh, allowing Rome to effectively counter the invasions initially of the Celts and then of, of, the, of the Germans and other populations from the east, in fact, this is, as, as we'll see also during the migration era, the, the, the point, right? All the populations that from, uh, say, not all of them, right? Some would penetrate also from the West, but let's say the, the, this um, the freely proper was the gateway to, to the Pop Valley, right? So all the, the, the Huns, the Goths, the Longobards would enter all from there, later the Magyars, etc. So in 300 uh, and, and the thing continued, by the way, there is an interesting, this is important to, to remember if you study also late medieval warfare of what is roughly, in fact, not nor today's northeastern Italy, southeastern Germany, and the, the northwestern Balkans, you realize that this fluxus of somewhat uh, mounted uh, horsemen, more or less step influenced and or hired by you know Germans, Italians, etc. Always cross sometimes the same dynamic into the Friuland plain through through the Alps, mostly the, the Vipaco Valley, um, with in Slovenia. Uh, say repeating in a way the same dynamics that you you find in part during the migration here, which we have we are not habituated to to picture like when we look at late medieval history but in many ways this mechanisms continued also in mercenarism and other phenomena but more of that later. Um, we also highlighted the ecclesiastical importance of Aquileia. In 381 an important council was held there presided by uh, presided over by Bishop Valerian and wanted by the same Saint Ambrose who had preferred Aquileia to his episcopal see in Milan to publicly condemn the Arian heresy and its followers. But meanwhile, the barbarian threat had been gathering 
in this uh, flourishing um, region. A first sign of danger was the incursion of the Marcomanni and other peoples connected with them who arrived in 167 uh, AD, not far from the walls of the same city. The emperor Marcus Aurelius and um, Lucius Verus r removed the scourge. Uh, later, the Aquileian territory was torn apart by the internal struggles of the empire itself, and when the city was besieged by uh, the usurper Maximinus Trax, I also made a, a video recently about that, the siege of Aquileia, and defended by the senators Crispinus and Menophilus that managed, in fact, to, to defeat with the Roman re uh, senatorial reinforcement uh, the same the same emperor and his mostly, in fact, mercenary arm. The resistance of Aquileia's inhabitants and the garrison obtained, uh, in fact, complete victory. And this episode is known as the Bellum Aquileiensis, which remained famous in the annals of the empire uh, as a proof of municipal uh, pride and esprit de corps, it's also for the daring of, of the local matrons, right? So, so actually an example of, of Romanization. In 261, a new incursion by the Germans emerging from the Alps was repelled by Emperor Gallienus. However, it produced serious, very serious damage on, on the territory. In 300, the Emperor Maximian, however, settled in the imperial palaces of Mediolanum and Aquileia. In these cities, he erected buildings of enormous proportions so as to make them appear as, as sort of second capitals, including, for example, a circus. Um, there are important Roman ruins in, in Aquileia. Um, and although the crisis of the third century had painful repercussions, on the city. Uh, this remained sea of numerous authoritative um, offices and institutions. It was still at the, at the death of Emperor Theodosius I, the ninth city of the empire, and the fourth of Italy after Rome, Milan, and Capua, famous for its walls and port. And consider that now Aquileia had already been sacked by the soldiers of Theodosius shortly after the victory obtained by him at the Battle of the Frigidus River over uh, Eugenius and Arbogastus. Um, and uh, in 452, Attila's Hunnic hordes gathered around Aquileia. This was the heaviest blow suffered by the city that was factually wiped out. Uh, Aquileia was guarded by a weak garrison. However, it, it, it did exist valiantly for about three months. Right, which is a big deal in those times, considering also, yes, it was a, a large city, but okay, not the largest in absolute terms. And in fact, this may be a, a legendary anecdote, but it said that the, the Huns managed to, to enter the city just because a part of the walls fell by themselves. Right, I don't know how realistic this is, I mean, but still stressing in, in the literature of the time the general idea of decadence right, by the 5th century that had struck the centers. Um, however, this is the point of, um, this is technically not Po Valley, but not Northern Italy is still, you know, the increasing strategic relevance, right, of these area. Um, this had already been since, I think, the time of the civil wars, controlling uh, Cisalpine Gaul equated to control Rome, right? That's where Octavian and Antony clashed uh, uh, for the, the control uh, of the West, and as you know, uh, as we've seen also with the rise of Milan as de facto capital of the empire, but other centers uh, uh, also in further north, like Trier or in the east, like uh, Naissus, Nicomedia, etc., um, had acquired kind of in, during the migration era kind of a m greater relevance because controlling it meant to control very important land connections, also, even that the Mediterranean traffics were somewhat disturbed, and still these cities were connected to, to the same terrain. So there was a, an important, um, a very important dimension that this previously, and still hinged from the rest of Italy, you know, area in general, what was acquiring, and that would be increasing, in fact, in the early Middle Ages, so that by the 
the high actually uh, northern central Italy would surpass the south whereas you know in, in ancient times it was just the center and the south instead that were the more advanced areas um, in any case uh, the Hunnic siege was um, was terrifying right the Huns entered the bridge in the walls they devastated the city with sacking and fire and the center no longer rose to its previous splendors after that massacre if not in fact as a small uh, as, a, as a small city to which only the ecclesiastical see and the ancient glories would confer fame but this was as you'll see important enough in medieval times um, so um, there was even um, somebody thought of reconstructing the city right it was, was repeatedly dreamed of but never completed because there weren't enough resources at the time uh, Aquilaria remained nevertheless an ideal reference point of exceptional importance even after the the fall of the Western Roman Empire thanks to the constitution of the Patriarchate in, in the 6th century um, so you know what what happens historically um, after the collapse of the West Roman Empire Friuli becomes part of the kingdom of the of the Doacre and subsequently of the Ostrogothic one of Theodoric the Byzantine reconquest follows uh, under Justinian 535 553 uh, so the fortified city of Forum Iuli um, in, in this period becomes first Gothic and then Byzantine um, as a castrum so maintaining its military character uh, as a fortress a key uh, to a part of the so-called in fact Limitania defense organized with walls and minor castles along the Eastern Alps against the barbarian assaults at some point we will have to make a video on the um, the border regions of, of the Empire or not only in the late Roman Empire but also in the early Middle Ages because it was a dramatic continuity of the same also in the Romano-Germanic kingdoms it was a net of f fortresses of of locks of um, of uh, walls etc very interesting to study also archaeologically speaking because they tell you how 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 they really worked as you know most of these areas were eventually settled by the uh, same federati when Theodoric took over Italy with his Ostrogoths he had to garrison Friuli that was quite important because uh, from there uh, you know there was also an access to the Noricum to the Lyricum so all areas that as you know were controlled from from Ravenna up to the Danube uh, in, in the north and several Ostrogothic military colonies were settled there in fact we still find the memory of it in the name of Gothia that is Gothia of some Friulan localities to this day indicating they had been settled by by in fact Ostrogothic garrisons this thing continued by the way especially in these areas that were not uh, particularly at least um, you know war on during the Gothic War uh, as, as the Byzantines maintained the local Gothic garrisons uh, after they took over Italy as they did as, as you know the Byzantines wouldn't eventually garrison uh, the the peninsula with a with a field army so they mostly relied on on the previous enemies that at that point had been crushed as a policy but they were still importantly settled in, in this border areas just like I don't know the Vandals against the Berbers in North Africa and they, they simply remained where where they were um, however the Byzantine control in the region was short-lived right in fact in 568 as we know the Longobard King Alboin descended from Pannonia through Nauportus, that is Ljubljana in Slovenia with a host of barbarians as you know from different nations it was the largest of the migration here it was mostly long birds uh, but were also Saxons Sarmatians Slavs um, Huns you know etc um, other many other people tell the truth but Friuli was the first duchy to be established in Italy 
by Alboin himself, who entrusted it to the noble Gisulf, a relative and collaborator of his, who was also Marfais, uh, essentially cavalry commander, marshal of the Longover people, entrusting him, in fact, with the mounted troops, the most valiant of the Fare, that is, the Longobard lineages, the Fahrgemeinschaft, and so Fahre is the Latinization of, Fahre, you know, the verb eventually Fahre, and that, that stresses the, this traveling communities of migrating clans, fundamentally, that lived autonomously off the land uh, during the migration, and that were settled in Friuli to guard the country and to secure the, um, the back of the Longobard migration who were coming down to Italy, and it took years, the only truth was just 568 is the traditional date, but there were different ways at different times, and against, in fact, the likely attacks of the others that had, in the meanwhile, settled in the Pannonian Plain, having agreed with the Longobards also to, you know, to, to make this shift happening smoothly, and the Slavs that were fundamentally expanding like an oil, uh, staying all, all over the, the places that the the other peoples were, were leaving, and in part, as you'll see, in fact, some Slavic journalists documented also in, in Longobard graves in Italy that have remarkably similar, uh, in fact, uh, ethnic background to the one of modern Poles, interestingly enough. Um, and the occupation of um, Friuli apparently took place without bloodshed, because, as we were saying before, the Byzantines did not have a field army in the region to, the, to defend themselves. Um, essentially, the, the few imperial troops mm, enclosed themselves into various centers that were, at some point, even coexisting with the Longobards up to the point they were simply dissolved, right? It was not even properly a siege, a uh, surrender, or something like that. And also, the Gothic garrisons often opened simply the gates to the Longobards and blended within them. And... Um, renaming their ducal capital Civitas for Iuli, the Longbirds historically erected imposing and prestigious, uh, prestigious buildings there that can still be admired, in fact, in today's Civitale that took the name, in fact, from Civitas. But it was for Iuli that instead gave the name to, to the broader era. Anyway, um, so the Longbirds, uh of course, integrated with the uh, with the Roman majority. Uh, it's true that northeastern Italy was kind of, and this is evident just in, in, in Roman times as in medieval times, let's say, less populated and urbanized uh, than the rest, let's say, of Lombardy, for example, or Tuscany, right? So uh, in the Longobard kingdom, eventually, there is the Neustria and the Austria, and the Austria is basically today's Venice region and part of the the the, the Trentine and Sud Tyrol and, and in fact Friuli and the so called Julian Venice as the, Ital uh, the Italians called it um, that um, you know were in fact different areas like Lombardy was had a, a major Roman continuity which is mirrored by the the same Longobard capital Pavia the you know the Longobard kings kept, uh, you know, attending the, the circus spectacles in Milan in other very important, big, by the way, Roman centers, with the largest uh, cities in Europe still, and Romanizing, importantly, you know, very widely populated area. The, the northeast, instead, like Friuli, was, was rougher, right, was somewhat um, retaining, in spite of the fact that Romans were the majority, uh, of the population, a, a more, eventually, in fact, Longobard character, more hardcore, um, and also militarized era, because this, the character, because this was a frontier era throughout all its history, and, and thus, uh, we can trace, in fact, much greater Longobard cultural continuity there, in, in many ways, we will see now. Um, so, the Longobards quickly, eventually, merged with with the with the population participating in the development including the civil and cultural one of, of the territory we we know very interesting things from 
from an archaeological point of view, if you look at the first uh, Longobard generation that settled, literally there are the entire uh, horses, right, buried with the, with, with, in fact, we, we have them both, with, with the warriors, and these are basically stepped peoples, right, they are, they were likely prevalently German, we, 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 we talked about this, but there was also an important Sarmatic element in it, and these were definitely Steppenvölker of, of some kind, and in Pannonia, as you know, there is the westernmost uh, end of the Eurasian steppes, and um, however, the broader fascias, the, the weaponry, the, the metallurgic, it's, it's heavily Germanic, and uh, we, we know it even from the, the first settlements, there are typical kind of central northern European types of huts and so on. The Longobards settled immediately in, in the cities, because in Italy that's what you had to control in order to rule the land, and initially they lived just in specific uh, households, quarters, but since the first generations we see, uh, say, an immediate uh, integration, uh, art changes from the brutal motives of the stamps, of the, you know, figures of dismembered uh, humans devoured by, you know, the universal uh, snakes, etc., to something milder, more kind of um, phytomorphic or you know, more, um, more smiling, let's say, um, mentality, reflecting some more smiling mentality, and uh, especially female fashion adapts quite quickly to the Roman one. This is witness also for peoples that were not particularly Romanized, like the Alamanni. Considered the Longobards were Alp Germans, so they, they, all, they, they had a lot in common with properly the Alamanni, with the, the Bavarians, and some of the, you know, older dialects in part we think survived uh, at a point in the in some remote alpine valleys right and we, we know Longobard in, in part fortunately which is an ancient language and of course we don't know too much but because it was uh, documented by by the high um, uh, say levels of Britain culture in Italy that the same Longobards immediately uh, adopted also because they had to start legislating in Latin, but sometimes they didn't know how to translate one specific meaning. There was, at least for for Latin, there was not a specific equivalence of, especially in juridical, in the kind of the Germanic juridical, uh, uh, say, shade of it. And so there are entire long word names used within this Latin writing, and it's it's a beautiful language, by the way. It's a hissing language. It tells you there properly that. The, the ferocity of, of these people that was famous historically for having, you know, been essentially an anti-social, you know, there were a few people historically in, in Germany, but they, they were at war constantly with everyone, and I, again, explained the stories in, in the Longobard history videos, but they were, in fact, always respected and made it true. It's one of the few ancient Germanic peoples witnessed by the Romans with an ethnonym that was found to be the, the Langobard, they sent by Tiberius on, uh, when he conquered Germany on the Elbe, where he found them. And um, that uh, speak of their incredible persistence, cohesion, they were the Longobard, long years, were properly Bodens' adoptive sons. And this incredibly cohesive capacity was always put to good use throughout the migration, it allowed them to survive against many foes and also integrating others and also catalyzing dramatically through this habit the, the same in fact germanization of the uh, of the roman population that we made a video just recently on to explain how that happened um, and they were factually the only functional elective monarchy that you know that you can historically find, especially during the, the Romano-Germanic period, and uh, their, you know, civil accomplishments, uh, even though nobody really talks about them, were by far the most advanced in the entire Romano-Germanic world. Um, and again, more of that in the Longobard playlist, because it's, it's, it's those things that, you know, Longobard history starts, it's just, you know, Albino arrives, takes over Italy, point, or and 200 years later, ah, the Longobards are conquered by the Carolingians, but what happened in, in between, Popular culture knows absolutely nothing about, thanks to the uh, incredible level of radical undereducation that 
you know, we, we find today, you know, people allegedly calling themselves Westerners and not knowing, of course, any form or substance of any form of Western history or culture for that matter. But um, this is not the, uh, the time to digress. Just for saying that um, the Longbirds settled firmly in Friuli and for, for many centuries there are ethno-linguistic traces of their legacy, right? Uh, for example, in the 15th century you still find Longbird institutions um, and uh, Longbird law is recognized as being in force for, a, for part of the population. This is actually true for other areas as well, so non-obvious ones such as for example, Southern Italy, you find it up to the 19th century, Longbird Law from the ancient Beneventan Laws that, by the way, were connected to the Friulian ones, because the Duchy of Friuli had a, a, even there, not intuitively from a geographical point of view, but a, a deep connection, as we will see, with the Beneventan ones, specifically, even more than with Lombardy. And I didn't, again, I, I must make more videos about Longbird history because I realized I didn't make enough of them. In any case, I have also a video about the so-called Longbird the Aminer, that would be essentially the Southern Longbirds, that, where I address some of that. Um, the wall Austrian, that is the Longbird Austrian, I mean, that is the northeastern Italian a region uh, bears witness in its toponomastics of the longbird uh, wolf slash canine totemic um, warlike practices of, of the people that were inherited even uh, in the heraldry of the powerful the La Scala signory of, of Verona for example are deeply connected with that symbolism that is all one also with the f with the fealty towards the empire this gibbelinism and in fact Friuli would always feel some kind of deep um, imperial um, attachment, as we will see now. And starting from the second half of the 7th century and for a good part of the following uh, one, um, you know, the, the fusion process between the Roman and Germanic elements was completed both in Friuli and in the rest of Longobard, Italy. And um, the, um, the, 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 the Germanic element, let's say, had already adopted, as we know, following the example of his own sovereigns, uh, at that point the Catholic uh, religion, specifically. Uh, when they migrated into Italy, they were Aryans, uh, at least their elites were, and even if the rest of the people were, they were still, however, also largely pagan. While Latin and the Romance dialects derived from it was um, increasingly generalizing within the Longobard ethnic group as an idiom of use and of oral communication, not only as the uh, only written language and culture of the time, of course. And this demonstrated, this is demonstrated by the same uh, Friulan dialect that has been formed in these centuries, which is completely novel. You know, that Friulan um, by some, uh, you know, it's not even considered Italian in the linguistic branches. It's, it's something new. It still belongs to the broader kind of Italic background, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, in the era, also other languages, similar languages are spoken, for example, Latin, etc. Um, so a quite dis distinctive, um, you know, Friulan dimension, even separated properly from the Venetian one, and instead is um, an Italian uh, dialect culture instead. And the Romance element linguistically, of course, remained prevalent, right? Uh, this can be seen from place names uh, in the vicinity of inhabitants, uh, say, of centers that had been at least founded by the Longbirds or later, even by the Slavs. So the era would always maintain that kind of more or less identifiable distinction between the Germanic, Slavic, and Italic uh, side, let's say. Um, and in fact, speaking of Friuli, with the subsequent linguistic passages, the name of Forum Iuli, as we were saying before, that was on on the lips of the Friulian populations of the time, was transformed into Friul, right? This is the actual name. Uh, also, Friul in German, for that matter and extended to indicate the entirety 
of the Longobard Friulan Duchy. So that's how it happened, right? The, um, Cividale, Forum Uli gave the name to the entire era, uh, right? To the entire duchy. It was, as you know, the main kind of province in within the the Longobard Kingdom. It's just like uh, the county among the Franks, right? And bearing witness of this more kind of kind of properly military dimension that the Longobards had and fought with the, the duchy that that means exactly that kind of a military district, whereas the Franks settling in in the Gallo Roman Ocean had maintained instead the 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 comitatus more per se. And this is a bit what happened to the same Longobards that had probably migrated even before Albo in, in southern Italy um, that was uh, still as federati, right, but under Byzantine control, and in fact it's it, in that south it's the only place where you find a Longobard comitatus, probably because it was influenced by the Romans in the same way. Um, also at this time the Patriarch of Aquileia that had been established in the 6th century had moved his residence to Cividale, by the way. And, however, the, the large sea had split in two after the arrival of the Longbirds, famously enough. It's a bit like the same process that brought to the further population of the Venetian lagoons. Um, the, when the Longbirds arrived, some Roman bishops um, escaped, fundamentally, and the, the, the one of Aquileia did it in Grado. It is a um, essentially a peninsula, right? It's a, in the lagoon, in the Adriatic lagoons, um, connected just, it's an island connected just by a tiny strip of land that the Longobards at the point also used to launch their raids into, in fact, the sea, which remained Byzantine, right? As most, uh, in fact, of the, uh, of the Venetian lagoons. Um, and also, namely, this ep Episcopal Sea um, of Aquileia, right? together so that there were two actual seas right and they were vi of course in conflict with one another but it was a very interesting rivalry because the same could be exploited by the same Rome to counter Constantinople and in fact as we will see the 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 Longobard church even when it was still kind of Arian, or at least not fully, ambiguously not fully Catholic, but still more faithful to Orthodoxy and to Rome in a broader Italian dimension than, than to Constantinople, especially after the uh, schism of the three chapters. It was a very famous um, instance where this kind of uh, papal dimension still sided with the Longbirds, paradoxically, rather than with the, the Byzantines. Um, in fact, the, the Freeland clergy obtained from the Longobard king and the duke um, the, the right to elect their own bishop, chosen from among the supporters of the three chapters in that instance, in fact, condemned by Constantinople and accepted by a part of the Italian clergy as a whole. And naturally, uh, let's say, th there was a succession of the eponymous bishopric that had preceded it, and the see. Uh, of one of m the most prestigious Christian authorities of the time. Um, and Aquileia had decayed on, uh, as a center, as we've seen, and um, his bishop first fixed his residence in Cormons. There was a large castle in the foothills, but then he wanted to take it to the seat of the Dutch, of the Longbord Dutch itself, driving out uh, another bishop in the process, that of Julius Carnicus, who had brought his see there after the original had been raised to the ground in the in the barbarian assault. And this was done by Calixtus, Bishop of Aquileia, um, who after that assumed the title of Patriarch, perhaps due to the fact that the see was considered by the Longobards to be the main one of their kingdom. They, they thought there was an enormous prestige attached to that. And, and it... It's understandable considering that they were battling for the control of Italy and given that there were these two twin, um, uh, in fact, patriarchates, this took on the meaning of this two different models, one pushed by the Byzantines, one by the Longbirds, contained in the same peninsula. And as you know, the Longbirds, as far as the Byzantines were concerned, probably won the struggle. 
Now, the um, Dacia of Friuli played also a prominent political and military role in the Longobard Kingdom. It had its dramatic events. Uh, it was in continuous struggle, fundamentally, uh, with the Avars and the Slavs. Uh, there were also some uh, internal issues that have been magnified when speaking about the Longobard Kingdom but that were never connected with uh, the uh, challenge to kind of the, the unity of the kingdom itself. The, the Longobards, contrarily to the normal Vulgata, never were kind of a bunch of disconnected quarreling duchies, right? The unity of the kingdom was recognized immediately since 584, was never contested again, and the only thing that happened is that at a point maybe a duke wanted to become king, and this happened rather than another, um, and for that competition they, they strived to occupy eventually the capital that always remained Pavi, and so everything was played within the same political and institutional structures of the kingdom including the same cities and at a local level. So there was n never right, uh, anything like a divided Longobard kingdom. Not even the, uh, the, the territorial discontinuity presented by the Byzantine territories ever made uh, the Longobards from the other side you know, saying, well, no, we don't obey uh, the, the kingdom, or, or we simply think that there is no such thing like a kingdom. Right? This was put down for, since the early... Um, days quite brutally and for good, right? At best what happened was the Dutch of Spoleto that the, the, the one of Benevent was quite faithful to, to Pavia, for example. The Spolitans at, at a point did side with the Byzantines but it's just because they were isolated uh, they, it's not that they played a, a major role in, the, in that regard uh, the heavy bulk of the kingdom was Lombardy and Tuscany, they were eventually centralized by the same monarchy and the Dutch of Friuli had no reason to oppose that order, also because uh, essentially uh, the interests of the monarchy in, the f in securing the eastern frontier was were the same existential one of the same Friulans, um, and just internal rivalries could could give rise to some discontent and. Uh, monarchic repression, not to a secession or to a separation or a division. For example, in 610, Cividale was sacked and burned by the Avars that had been called by the same Longobard king Agilulf, that was also one of the greatest ones of, in, in Longobard history and that secured a dramatic power and normalized the relation with the, with the papacy, actually have, after having besieged Rome. Uh, but eventually, you know, opening a new phase and the same one of full Catholicization, the same monarchy. Um, and he was based in Milan. He had married famously the Catholic princess Theodolinda, who was also connected, in fact, with Saint Columba, Gregory VII. So we're talking about big, a big game. And this duchy had been, he said, rebel at, at a point to because they they kept quarreling mostly with one of Trent and they uh, disobeyed some uh, some royal uh, policies. The Friulan Duke Gisulf II had uh, disobeyed Agilulf actually for issues concerning the the same patriarchate of Aquileia, the, the Tricapitoline schism, right, so things that had not really to do with the unity of the kingdom per se. In any case, um, Gisulf the second fell in battle, right? Uh, the inhabitants uh, of Chirivitale were partly killed and partly taken to Pannonia as slaves, by the way, by the Avars. And the Duchess Romilda, who, according to the um, story of Paul the Deacon that tells, in fact, the event, would have opened the doors of the fortress to the Avars by trusting pacts offered by them, and she was impaled instead um, by the by the invaders, and her name thus remained for centuries execrated uh, by by the locals. and And Paul the Deacon Historia Longobardorum is quite instructive because, albeit being written in the Carolingian era, 
is uh, a, a treasure, really, of early Germanic uh, values, uh, ideals, folklore, etc. Just like the Edict of Rotary is the most important of the Germanic laws, etc. Because, it, it, you know, the Longobards subjectively maintain a degree of, you know, probably of, of, of cultural identity that was further refined by the ex the government experience and that brought them to legislate, to rule in quite an effective advanced way thanks to the again to, to the to the local progressed um, you know resources and, and and background in the first place. And the the episode of Romilda is quite um, disturbing but it, it's exactly designed to show the longer birds that First of all, you have never to surrender because a true warrior never surrenders. Like, there is n never an option, right? Because you cannot achieve divine transfiguration if you don't, and you can't be saved otherwise. And secondly, um, there's a very interesting uh, female, um, let's say, role in set of female roles in the, in the history that at a point, however, are strictly say show quite strictly the, the the two spheres of separation of the male the female dimension and of course Romilda is a woman and she uh, she's not meant to to cope with uh, with the others and to to make a decision regarding military affairs right and so she is intended here properly as the weaker one this is the, the mentality of the time that pays dramatically uh, and making the, the the rest of the community paying dramatically for her uh, milder kind of you know gentle souled background that however is absolutely what you cannot afford if you want to have any political military rule right so that obviously uh, even though women are very important in, in, in Longobard culture they're very protected and controlled by the Germanic role absolutely cancel from your mind that Germanic women, you heard that bullshit uh, from uh, a very weird, strange kind of feministic, white suprematistic people obsessed with, um, you know, the, the, I would say the neo-Norse view of, 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 of the story that would like to make you believe that uh, Germanic law was permissive towards women. It was the radical diametric opposite of the case, right? You know, women were actually even freer in, in, in Christian world and uh, and the reason why actually what Longbird reality shows you is the one a deeply Romanized one at the end of the day uh, and not only that but um, you know still women could not affect it was true also in, in Roman in the Roman world Could, couldn't be for example female empresses because the Imperium was held exclusively by men and this was shared by both the Romans and the Germans but exactly because the woman cannot do certain things according to these cultures, it must be protected, it must be provided fairly with a, a degree of security and safety that um, is, is unknown to men, or instead the ones who have to provide that, right? So this is also for the feministic deliriums that would like to make us pretend that women were oppressed throughout history. Women throughout history had it dramatically easier than men, by far. Right, uh, all the freaking time. Right, what, what to expect? Um, it has to take care of, of anything. Right, in, a, in mostly a military and an agricultural society. Right, between a man and a woman. Just just answer that question. Right, it's not that women had it easy, but they had dramatically easier than men. Always, all the time. So, uh, this is a pretty macroscopic evidence that if you have even started to study things that are not specifically Marxistic and that are actually the average you find in any university publicly uh, even at least here in Europe in, I don't know in, in the States perhaps it's not picked up to this point but um, that's the the standard right there's not even a diversional option to this concept uh, because of course there is no evidence of the contrary and um, in any case uh, the Freeland story here is marked by massacres because, uh, and of leadership made by massacres because the sons of Gisulf escaped massacre, right? Uh, normally here the, 
the the Longbird Man Warriors were either to win or die, right? So there is this habitual bath of blood to strike, especially the free will and nobility, that is the one we know better, by the way, because of Paul the Diacon, who was a free line himself, right? We, we don't have the same degree of knowledge, for example, of the same Longobards of Lombardy at the same time, because there was nobody really to write from that background, just like Paul the Diacon, that is at the same level of, uh, you know, Isidore of Seville, Gregory of Tours, Bait the Venerable, etc. Um, but objectively, yes, they were, ca and they were very proud about uh, of their, probably, they were also a bit complex of the fact that they still lived in a, in a less developed land compared to, to the Neustrians, let's say, in Pavia and Milan, etc. But uh, they, they, they thought they still had it, that they were s still kind of the true Longbirds because they had maintained a kind of more traditional um, uh, and moral way of life compared to the Germanic background. So Gisel's children escaped the massacres um, and then succeed uh, one another in the Friul and Duchy, while the youngest, that is Grimald, took refuge in Benevent. And then he became its, its duke, later ascending to the Longbert throne, while this was contended by various uh, northerners. Um, eventually Grimald puts an end to the last uh, agitations. This is also the, the time in which formerly the court Factions were divided between Catholics and Arians, but in practice, um, that had that were just names. They hadn't anything to do with, at that point, any theological matter. It was just an excuse to compete for the throne. Later, and I mentioned from from the end of the seventh century, Catholicism is fully affirmed, and um, the apogee of the Longobard kingdom actually is reached under Lutbrand, uh, that was the most Catholic. Uh, example of a ruler in the first place, uh, in a hell of a monarch, by the way. Um, but the free and dukes sustained also great struggles against the Slavs. Um, for example, the Duke Ferdulf fell in battle. We were hinting at him the other day in that video about how the medieval aristocracy often threw itself in, in the fray without allegedly thinking of the considerations. But there is all the story of Ferdulf that uh, W wanted to storm a Slavic hilltop where the enemy had entrenched itself uh, ferociously, you know, with lots of stones would throw against defenders, and and it was another, um, and it, w it was uh, another long bird who was named Arga, and Arga is the the worst offense in the entire Germanic world. It means you're a coward, right? And so he said, "Look, but if we attack the hilltop, like this, the Slavs will will butcher us," and and Ferdulf that of course is you know fully you know loaded uh, of himself says you know and then you're you're an Arga both by name and by fact so at the end of the day competing with one another they both charge the Slavs uphill and and the entire Longbird army gets massacred so this was the entire Friul and nobility that was slaughtered and there is, there's just one guy Pemmo who becomes Duke and manages um, to to actually um, inflict the Slavs at the size of defeat in the Drava Valley, so uh, ransoming uh, the the Longbird Honor there, and also rising basically all the children of the of the of the Longbird of the top Longbird nobility, at least that had been massacred in the previous battle. And um, at this point, the eastern borders of Friuli and thus of the Longobard Kingdom were secured. And under Pemmo and his successors, the Friuli Duchy had its greatest uh, splendor. Right, we're talking specifically of uh, Ratkes and Heistulf, that would become even king of the Longobards themselves. And there is a very interesting story that concerns Pemmo and his adoptive children here. Because at a point, um, Lutprand entered in contrast with Pemmo for, not because he had anything against him, but there was uh, an ecclesiastical matter always with the, the patriarchate to, to settle. 
and Lutprand had appointed for political pragmatism, uh, in fact, a, a patriarch that Pema said uh, was opposed to. And so, uh, given that the Freelands, again, felt very much about their own honor and decision, uh, they arrived to disobey Lutprand because they said, this is not right. And Lutprand goes to Cividale at the court of the Friuland dukes and he um, basically deposes Pemmo, which was an insult because it basically meant that he was deprived of his of his ducal and thus you know his entire personal say his value as a man right um, he was accused of treason because he had disobeyed the monarch so that was also what Lutprand as a longer king could not tolerate in front of, of the people right because you know that w the, the power there the imperium was mo more important than anything else but he knew that uh, the sentence was unjust and that he just had to do it to not to create further troubles with with the ecclesiastical administration with Rome with consequences that would have engulfed you know, the entire kingdom in far worse issues. But at that point, Heistulf, future king, um, unseated his vote, and he was about to kill Lutprand. He was stopped by his brother Ratkis on the spot, um, because he had dared, Lutprand had dared insulting his adoptive father in that regard. So the, the Longobards were all about this thing, the feud, the honor, the, you know, hot blood, and all this kind of... Um, vendetta mindset let's say and and Lutbrandt was so impressed by by Heistel's courage because um i think he fled at that point but he was for uh, Heistel fled but Lutbrandt was deeply impressed by his courage and that was an actual treason like he wanted to kill the king but to them you know uh, kingship was was nothing like you know the, the freemen were equal in their longbird mindset and Lutbrand knew that and he estimated enormously Eistulf so that at the end of the day he f forgave everyone there Pemmo, Eistulf, also all those who had supported them and he actually proved his um, you know his esteem as a great reward to them when he appointed Ratkis and Heistulf as commanders of the law of the Royal Army Rearguard at um in, in an expedition against the rebel Spoleto that had allied with the with the exarchs of, of Ravenna. And Ratkis uh, Ratkis at this point had succeeded Pema's Duke, right? And uh he was with his younger brother Heistolf. Ratkis, as you'll see, passes more for a, you know, spiritual figure, a bit of a saint, almost. Um, and the the enemies ambushed the the Longobard army in that in that expedition in the forest between Phanum and um, and Centinum, pretty tough ground with lots of mountains, forests, etc. And the Friuland rear guard repels the enemy heroically, right? A bit like, you know, Roland at Roncesvalles, except they won. And that kind of sealed the, the utmost respect uh, of, uh, of Lutbrand uh, for, for the Friolans were also vindicated and paving the road to eventually the kingship of the same. First Ratkis and then Eistolf. Ratkis was eventually deposed by the same Longobard nobility. He, he retired into a monastery and Eistolf became king. And Eistolf is the same one who fought eventually against uh, the Carolingians when they invaded the country at uh, Pippin, the short at least. Um, and the Friulans uh, maintained their their kingship, in fact, until, uh, in fact, Heistulf was repeatedly defeated by the Franks that came into Italy with a much tougher uh, army and um, a professional one, as a matter of fact, also a pretty big one, and the, the, the Longobards were bold. The same Heistulf got almost himself killed in attacking the same Franks who were br broken through or had managed to bypass the locks in the Western Alps from, from Gaul. Um, 
And at a point, Heisulf died in a, in a hunting accident among these events. Uh, we will not digress on what the Longbirds were doing and as a kingdom, because we're talking just about Friuli. But uh, Rathkis uh, was called back from, from the monastery to succeed his, his deceased brother. And we know also that experience had, uh, because the, these kings kept legislating. So we know, especially Lutbrand, Rathkis, they, they I still I still made an important military reform of the Longbird arm. And uh, Rathkis was much more at that point kind of very, you know, uh, very mystical in, in nature. So at a point, the Duke of Brescia, Desiderius, um, was, be became, f followed Rathkis as, as a king. And Desiderius was, so he was an Austrian, came from Brescia na near Milan. And he had essentially bought his crown from the Pope and the Franks. And the Friulan nobility said, you bought that crown. We are not meant to obey you. And, and that's the only moment at the end of the kingdom, at the very end of it, because at this point, Italy had already been invaded by the Franks. Everybody had understood how it would have gone. But the Friulans said, no, we will not obey a king that is fundamentally appointed by, by some stranger, an enemy. And so at this point, the Friulans organize a sort of rebellion. Like, uh, actually, they, they didn't do anything against Desiderius because, you know, it would have brought more harm to both in the face of the Frankish onslaught. But when the Franks took over Italy um, with Charlemagne, finally, the Friulans thought that it was the Neustrians who had been defeated, right? And, and not the Austrians. So in fact, also the, some dukes of the, the Venetian area were, you know, were from their side. So they brought on the struggle against Charlemagne. And I plan to make a video about uh, a little known episode in military history that instead is quite fascinating. I mean, it's just a couple of sources. In fact, regarding the so-called battle of the Livenza River, which is told only by two sources. One is essentially um, pro-Frankish, or at least tells the Frankish side of the story, and what pro-Longbar, at least telling the Longbar side of the story. And the official version that eventually pervades historiographically is the Carolingian one, that is to say, uh, a few months after the fall of Pavia, the Duke of Friuli Rothgaud um, uh, united with some other duke of the Venices, raised the banner of rebellion. At that point, the Carolingians were engaged in Saxony to quell some of the usual rebellions, and given the importance of Italy and this Friulian rebellion, uh, uh, Charlemagne himself rushed quickly right, to, to the Italian kingdom, because again, that was the one with which the same imperial crown was connected, which Rome was connected, we, we explained countless times what was the hierarchy. Uh, we'll see it better now also with, um, with the status, uh, status of Friuli uh, in the Holy Roman Empire. And according to the Carolingian version, the Frankish army defeated the Austrians in open field. So much that Charlemagne is said to have celebrated Easter in Treviso, that is in the, Ven in the now pacified Venices in the same year. Uh, another source actually claims something else. It claims that the Longbirds not just fought Charlemagne in open field, but also defeated the Frankish army. Right, And there is um, an interesting historiographical debate that began because the previous version was saying, well, yes, after all, we know that Friuli later on was eventually uh, controlled by Carolingian appointed um, officials, etc. But in, in the same time, it was a very gradual thing, and Friuli was even given some important autonomy, even after the facts. Even though we cannot know what really happened uh, on the Livenza River, we can assume that there was some sort of if not a Frankish defeat, at least a Pyrrhic victory, and that this brought to a compromise with the Friulian nobility, right? And um, 
surely interesting things happen here because the broader revolt there was engineered together with the uh, the Byzantines, uh, also uh, Desiderius exiled son with the southern Longobard duchies that were also more distant from the Carolingian interference. So it, it was a big plan, right? And so there were some hands that were cut, definitely in the process. Some some Longobards were were killed, surely in 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 combat somewhere. Others were exiled with their families to Francia, um, where many also presumably perished of misery and hardship. Um, some others fled to Bavaria or among the others, but in practice we see that, again, the autonomies of the Friuland duchies were maintained by the Carolingians later on. And this makes us suggest, in face of just two sources, that to say two diametrically opposite things that, unfortunately, we will never know, but that there may have been maybe even this kind of coming back of the so-called Austrians as those who had not been defeated yet by Charlemagne, right? And that saw themselves as also kind of the direct continuators of um, of the Longbert royal legacy as also the southern Longbert's vote later on. Considered that the St. Paul the Deacon was the brother of one of the leaders of this revolt. And so... Um, he also, he had a point when, um, you know, he was instead invited by Charlemagne at court. He had important connections. He was one of the most important scholars of his time. So there is there a deep connection with the Longobard kingdom that the Carolingians always um, treasured for political reasons, but also because of great esteem that the Franks had always had towards the Longobards. In fact, they were the only people in Europe that they thought to be peers with, right? And this is very relevant because the Carolingians admired greatly the fact that the Longobards hadn't Romanized, in, in, in institutionally speaking, right? That the Carolingian court was still aware of, you know, the Germanic background. Of they came from Austrasia after all, but they ruled now on a specifically Catholic, Roman Catholic country that was the same meaning of the entire Carolingian Empire per se. The Longobards were just a kingdom, a smaller, more modest, but very civilly advanced because they were Romanized, but practically not formally. Right? They were kings of the Longobards, their laws were Germanic, so they had never compromised with any other kind of non-Germanic identity. Uh, all the locals had become Longobards, the Euro, right? And that's what they had also being very proud of, as this would be evidence also in, in Carolingians in Octonian times, where the Longobards were not just highly regarded by the empire, politically and juridically, but also were extremely proud of their own Germanic identity, despite being Romans, being Italians, de facto. And in 774, following the conquest of the Longobard kingdom, Charlemagne assumed, ha had assumed the title of Grazia Dei Rex Francorum et Langobardorum atque Patricius Romanorum. So Charlemagne was king of the Franks and of the Longobards, right? A honor that had never been given to any other people out of the Franks, right? Uh, Charlemagne was not king of the Burgundians or, or of the Alamanni or the Aquitaines because there was no such thing like a kingdom of them. They had been uh, uh, lessened. Right, the Longobards were the ones whose kingdom had remained as a pillar of the Christian Roman Empire of Charlemagne, and that was coupled with the Frankish one at the same level. Right, and also Patrician of the Romans, which is so an interesting title, of course, in the uh, in the pre also imperial coronation times. Uh, also, the Longobards at, at a point had become kind of protectors of the of the Romans be when they had taken over Ravenna, for example, they had been see of the Byzantine exarchate. But just for saying that, um, the, this was effectively a personal union of two kingdoms that were maintained each own in their own, uh, at the same level and in, in their own 
uh, equal regard. Charles, in fact, chose to keep the Leges Langobardorum in, um, in Italy, right? It didn't enforce Frankish law like in Saxon, right? Um, also because we have explained it countless times that the Longobard kingdom was light years ahead, civilly, juridically speaking, compared to one of the Franks. So Charlemagne drew enormously from, from, from this background in order also to, to centralize equally, right? The, the Franks were ruling as private lords. The Longobard dukes were ruling as civil officials, right? Which is a completely different thing. They were literate. They, uh, they instructed trials. They, they, they really lived within a, a royal administration that existed in this kingdom, and it would man be maintained. It's at the base of the same communes, of the revival of Roman law, of the universities, and so on. And um, the also replacement of Longobard dukes with uh, Frankish aristocrats was very gradual, right? Mo the, the Carolingians essentially waited for the duchies, the, the, the various dukes to, to die biologically on, on their own to eventually just appoint a Frankish count because uh, in fact among the Longobards there was no such thing like uh, succession right in, in office right uh, familiarly speaking um, and the the rulers were elected including the dukes so this was you know the Carolingians didn't press on Italy because again the, the various rebellions that occurred were threatening the entire stability of, of of the of the empire and they could not be afforded by any degree um, however over time of course many Frankish faithful were placed also as simple uh, retinues as military uh, groups right um, as aristocrats and also in Friuli some lands were given to them in beneficium according to the vassalatic in fact beneficiary um, practice that had been developed in Gaul, which constituted a stable garrison, first of all, for the for the country, and gave also the the first origin to the formation of of a feudal culture in Italy that up to that point had not quite known it. Right, the the Longobard clientels were again quite small compared to the to the Frankish ones, and that's why. You know, it was no such thing like the same level of professional development of the military that the Franks were pioneering. But in Europe, in fact, nobody had. So that was rather the normality. Um, and um, this, of course, the, the, same, the, the, the Carolingian conquest wasn't uh, a light event anyway. There had been a war. Pavia had been besieged for nine months, which is the, the exception in the entire Carolingian military history. So the country had been shattered there are there is a an erosion of the middle classes let's say and uh, uh, also a blend in the process of that uh, original juridical division between the the romans the the longobards as far as uh, the at, at least at that point the byzantine held areas and the longobard held areas were concerned that's why you know we start talking about an Italian background mostly because in the kingdom it was central northern Italy basically everyone became kind of a of a long bird right um, and there were also frontier areas in history and other areas that the longbirds had kept expanding in Provence and you know the, in the south there are more complex to study juridically but the bulk at least was made up of longbird subjects and some Roman subjects especially in the area of Rome that was, however, importantly populated by large, that had already been populated by large amounts of Germanic subjects, were also imperial subjects. Um, and so juridical status was, of course, recognized, etc. But we'll see this better in other videos. In any case, coming back to Friuli, the land was reorganized on a count basis and was framed together with the other former Longobard territories in the Regnum, in fact, Longobardorum, or Italicorum, in fact, that's the difference, that it passes from 
from a Longbert to an Italian character in a sense, even though everybody knew the Italians for like I don't know the Arabs, the the French as the Lombards, right? From everywhere, it was Langobardia, right? So Italy was just a synonym of of Longobard in the first place. And Charlemagne found adhesions among the uh, also the in fact the Roman areas. Think about the the papal crown, etc. And in the Longobard ones, it it um, uh, it was obvious by that point that after the collapse of 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 the Longobard monarchy was useless to hope for a resurgence of the ancient independent kingdom that in many ways as we've seen was still largely central and independent in fact you know uh, Charlemagne's successors uh, attached eventually to to in, in the various partitions to Italy the most important role with Lothar the first especially um, we were talking about it just the other day uh, in the various post carolingian times speaking of the relation with Burgundy and and Italy at that point. Among the favorite courtier of Charles, we find the famous patriarch Paulinus uh, of of Aquileia, a kind poet and distinguished theologian, as well as Maxentius, who was Paulinus' successor to the patriarchate. Uh, also, the aforementioned Longobard historian and poet Paul the Deacon, authored the famous Historia Longobardorum, for for a long time was Latin grammar professor at the court of Charlemagne. In 825, uh, the Emperor Lothar I promulgated also the Capitular of Corte Olon, which established the imperial schools. In addition to Pavia, still capital of the Kingdom of Italy, both as an, under the Longbirds and under the Carolingian, Cividale also as a public school of law, rhetoric, and liberal arts. And all the students of the Friuli Mark depended on the studium of Cividale. So Friuli was organized, as we've just said, by Charles as a mark, specifically. It is a border county, district, if you prefer, still to face the Avars and the Slavs as you know rulers had changed but enemies hadn't and of the Fruland margraves or dukes because the title also kind of was alternated at the time we mentioned Eric who in the days of Charlemagne fought against the Avars also crushed some centers against the Slavs and also died in in battle with them later Eberhard these are interestingly if you look Eric Eberhard these are not long birth names anymore these these are Frankish ones right onomastically they appear in Italy just at that point um, Eberhard specifically was husband of a daughter of Louis the Pius and father of the future king and emperor Berengar the first of Friuli and in fact during the reign of the latter a terrible scourge reversed themselves on Friuli. The incursions of the Magyars who destroyed everything in their passage. Along the Friulian roads, thus large desert areas were formed, which were then granted by the emperors to the patriarchs or to barons from beyond the Alps. Often, uh, they were essentially trying to repopulate the lands, partly using the local population, partly by introducing Slavs from Carantania and Carniola. Um, and this um, origin of the um, of the towns with Slavic names that are found along the Great Road Artery uh, that from Cadroipedus Quadruvius leads to Pordenone and beyond, in fact, witness uh, the, the this important population efforts. However, these allogen elements quickly merged with the local ones and by the 14th century practically no difference um, distinguished them ethnically instead the use of slavic dialects continued in the colonists introduced later in the 12th and 13th centuries to populate the high valleys of the isonzo and natizone rivers and the the, east, the the nature of the eastern frontier was quite 
uh, bloody per se. Like already under the Longbirds, as we've seen, uh, there were several incursions, especially from from the Avars, that were the most threatening, but that eventually died out towards the the eighth century. Um, that were followed by large groups of Slavs that took the chance also to settle in the more uh, you know, in the wilder areas, especially in the mountains, the plateaus, and the, the Carolingians had revived expeditions against properly the, for example, the the Croatian highlands. I made a video about uh, early medieval Croatia that talks exactly about this, and you see there Eric, all these other dukes of Friuli that were essentially um, also cooperating with the um, with the Germans of the Eastern Mark from the Danube in a sort of pincer movement against the the Croatian and the, the Pannonian Slavs that were there and were kind of tough to, to subdue because they would know how to also quickly entrench themselves in their hill forts in the forests um, while the uh, the Germanic and Italic armies were a bit more kind of developed and made for greater engagements. There were lots of sieges as well and there were very difficult operations and the era was very significant strategically because it both uh, on the Adriatic coast and in the Danubian um, in the interland, let's say in, from the Danubian watershed as well, they contended power to um, a reviving Byzantine power that at that point in fact was able to counter, as you know, the, the same incursions in saying um, on the same Dalmatian coast, but in the same Venice. I mean, Charlemagne's son Pippin died of malaria, famously enough, at the siege of of uh, Venice, right? And so there is a lot of context here that is would be interesting to expand, but let's focus on Friuli still. And in fact, there was also an internal uh, issue there that was the that was freely being involved following the dismemberment of the Carolingian state in the struggle for power in Italy in the last decades of the 9th and in the early 10th century. That was a, a, it's a very complicated time and in, in, uh, in place in history. We haven't made practically any video about that. Just the other day in the Burgundian history one, I was talking about Duke of, uh, of Provence, of the uh, various uh, Rudolphs of Burgundy that intervened in Italy at different times, but the the real protagonists were, in fact, the the Friulans, the Vrans, the Spalatians, um, the Tuscans at some point, and that's all a, a part of history that we have to look at because it's extremely complicated and and the fact that from northeastern Italy, still um, the local mark could have even imperial ambitions. Uh, as for example, the the same Marquis Berengar was crowned as King of Italy in 888 and then Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in Rome in 915, shows how powerful, in fact, the, the local dukes really were, uh, considering that there were many other competitors and they were the most distant from Rome. So one can speak there of some kind of freeland war likeness uh, that was uh, tested at various points. The, the Friulans at this time score actually less uh, victories than in the early days, but they, the, the Berengar, um, for example, is, is, uh, doesn't, really, doesn't really manage to control the, the, the kingdom. So nobody really did entirely because post-Carolingian times everything was fragmented, nobody did anywhere. But this, the, the Magyar incursions especially were very severe brought the Italian ability to recur to this other, you know, to, 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 to other leaders at a time. Uh, the Freelands were defeated several times, but still came back on their feet in some way, so um, eventually Friuli, as we will see, will not become a major power on its own, but still this phase highlights how there were some important resources and potential to be, uh, to be spent. And there were also further feudal agglomerations in the broader post-Carolingian, uh, let's say, assortments of, of countries later on, that particularly invested, in fact, northern, northeastern Italy and southeastern Germany at the point, for example, Friuli was at some point connected even with, within Bavaria, that arrived up to 
the Adriatic Sea. And in fact, what you really see, aside from this um, kind of short-lived uh, agglomerations, is that Friuli remains a bit more isolated than the rest of, for example, communal Italy later on, with less, again, urban development, more of a feudal culture, and styles that are much more reminiscent of, actually, of the Germanic region than, than the, the Italian one. Um, this is witnessed even in arms and armor. We could make videos to, to show this. It's very interesting. And it was always connected in that bigger game of, again, the Austrians, the Bavarians, the Tyrolians, the Corinthians, uh, naturally also Venice, Hungary, and the same uh, northeastern Italian communes in the process. And uh, it, was a, it, it always remained a frontier land. Or you can argue still is, right? If you if you consider this important cultural background, where you can't still find these characteristics. In 951, Friuli came to constitute with a large part of the Venices the so-called Mark of Verona and Aquileia that extended between the Julian Alps and Lake Garden, which had as its capital the city of Verona, as a matter of fact. It had been another very important Longobard center. And in the 10th century, the, 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 the mark entered the Ottonian orbit, as well as the Saxon uh, royal dynasty took over Italy and secured the imperial crown, as you know, to found ideally what we call the Holy Roman Empire, as if we're distinguished from the one of Charlemagne or from the Roman Empire entirely, but it's really not. Um, so this brought Friuli actually to strengthen its ties with the empire, right? We have seen it in, um, in the video comparing Asti and Aquileia, because the, as we'll see now, the same patriarchate was used as a political pawn to consolidate imperial power in Italy. Right, because it was a bit more of a feudal land, so where the the German style mech, uh, political institutional mechanisms work better than, say, the, this kind of proto communal uh, areas, uh, then like Lombard or Tuscany, that were the most complicated to control, to say the least. And um, and with mirroring in that sense, in fact, the same. Uh, power that the German episcopate had, right? Also in terms of political and military power, like Aquileia is much more. Eventually, as you know, in 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 Italy, that there wouldn't be other real ecclesiastical principalities. Like Aquileia is just the only one, right? And so it, it's 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 as if it were an appendix of the of the Germanic lands, where bishoprics, um, uh, uh, archbishoprics, etc., were actual states within states and they, they were military powerful and so on um, and the end of the independent kingdom of Italy with the attempt of revival by Berenger II and his nobiliar faction uh, which was incidentally in fact also opposed initially to, to the to the Ottonians and to this kind of uh, practice of in, endowing the bishops with greater power brought profound changes in the condition of Friuli. Cividale, which while it was the capital of the Eastern Mark or Austria, according to the language of the time, had taken the name of Civitas Austria, so the city of Austria, preserved throughout the Middle Ages is now at the head of a simple county, right, which forms part of the Mark of Verona, united by Otto I, by the way, to the Mark of Carinthia, to better secure the passes of, of the Alps. So kind of bridging, like, you know, this, um, the two watersheds to, to, to control the passes better. However, suspicious of their own vassals themselves, the Margraves of Verona and the Counts of Friuli uh, the emperors of the House of Saxony and later the Salian House erect against these great secular lords the political power of the Aquileian Church. Uh, in other words, these were the times in which, in fact, Italy was slipping away again 
from Germanic control. And so, um, in this, as we were just saying, in this more, not necessarily fragmented, but in a place where, for example, the power of the of, of the various cities was generally weaker. The Patriarchate of Aquileia, as a, as a kind of a landlord, as a feudal lordship, was dramatically increased. And, and, and in the process, the Patriarchs received from the Emperors vast lands, numerous castles, roads and bridges of great importance, as well as sovereign rights of all kinds. These were essentially imperial vicaries in Italy. Right? They, they constituted that, uh, they, they covered that role, albeit they weren't eventually to emerge as major powers like the the patriarchs of Aquileia at a point did participate to military expeditions they were actually quite warlike um, but uh, they weren't in this sense particularly different from other bishops in Italy that did the same but still within the frame of the broader communal struggles that started from the cities and the major ones in this broader inter-city alliances of which Friuli didn't really take part on a larger scale. As we will see there was a, an, a communal phenomenon locally that was more modest from the other areas, right, even from the, the neighboring uh, Veneto area that, that had an important communal activity but it was not even as developed as the one of Lombard in Tuscany. Um, but very often it was, a, in fact, a struggle over, over the, say, the leverage that the control of Friuli could, could have for, for the surrounding areas, not much because of a local, you know, force drawn, uh, like in terms of local re material resources, for example. And this doesn't mean that naturally the patriarchs were not powerful themselves, right? They actually exercised, in fact, a control, as we will see, on the same communes locally. And that's part of the reason why, this, why the communes were also less developed than elsewhere, because this, there was this major feudal lord controlling them. O already in the first half of the uh, 11th century, at the time of the famous patriarch Popo, the Church of Aquileia had reached a very great temporal power. But this became even greater when, in the heart of the struggle for investitures, the Emperor Henry IV, the Salian, the one clashing bitterly against Gregory VII, granted his most faithful patriarch, Sigeard, first the county of Friuli, with ducal rights, and later even Carniola. Again, the German connection is important here. The patriarchs of Aquileia were strongly felt properly also within the within the within Germany in terms of political balance etc considered and up to the 12th century the, the the German emperors believed very much in the possibility of uh, of supporting their own universal policy on the base of the Italian communes right and so you find some lists of the various um, let's say magnates let's say or at least properly the cities at that point that had to respond, kind of the imperial call, and you realize that among the greatest prince, that there, are, there are lots of Lombards, first of all. This is in Swabian time, so considering also the proximity of Swabian Lombard, but the patriarch of Aquileia is always there. It's a major figure, right? He often crossed the Alps to go to Germany to belongs to, 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 to participate to synod, to councils, etc. So, in many ways, again, this land lived very much also mentally projected beyond the Alps, right? Uh, but still being from, from the other side, and so kind of being in both fields at the same time. This provided it, of course, as we were just saying, but an important power on their own. That, in fact, as a state, the patriarchs of Aquileia m m maintained from 1077 to 1420, and which had a vast territorial expansion. Um, so this state entity soon established itself as one of the most important and powerful political formations, uh, especially in Italy, uh, but also in the empire, uh, especially from, from an ecclesiastical point of view at the time. And it was endowed since the 12th century with, with a parliament as, as well, made up 
but made up of ecclesiastical and lay barons and representatives of small Friulan cities. Uh, that was essentially the highest expression of Friulan uh, culture from an institutional point of view. And the parliament also provided for an assembly representation of the communes emerging in the region. Right? And not only of nobles and the clergy, as we were saying, that, that is um, irrelevant because the Friulan communal development was, as we've seen, um, you know, more modest than in other areas of the peninsula, but still relevant for the uh, power dynamics of the same patriarchate and of Friuli in, in general. There were other powers here, for example, the county of Gorizia that today we do not discuss, as we were remembering at the beginning. Um, but they should be covered at the point because they, these were also areas that had, again, a foot across the Alps and they were controlled and influenced by by the Habsburgs, by by other powers and they're really meaningful also from a military point of view frankly because they catalyzed the, the aforementioned uh, injection of kind of S Germanic, Slavic, Hungarian mercenaries in Italy and that was the, the way, the bridge they controlled so it was apparently a modest power but actually a, a relevant one uh, in the in the broader balance. Thus the life of the Patriarchate lasted for over six centuries, even under Venetian domination, that is the, uh, the, 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 the end of the story, let's say, it, it was emptied of power at the time, but the Parliament convened for the last time in 1805, right, and just a little bit later was abolished by Napoleon himself. Consider about Venice that uh, the Maritime Republic was expanding mostly uh, on, you know, in, on, on, on the sea, right? They had colonies scattered all over. They seized Crete, some other land masses, Ovea, etc. But they weren't considering the territorial expansion. That would start only from the early 15th century and Friuli was just next door right so one of the major in international implications is that Friuli was an imperial land historically it was part of the kingdom of Italy and it had been taken by Charlemagne and so it had remained whereas Venice did not belong to the Holy Roman Empire never did and so was the um, terra firma expansion of Venice really meant is that was it was an usurpation of imperial prerogatives and as we will see the empire in venice would fight for the control of Friuli. that remained always contented in spite of, of different settlements that we will see later so in the early days considered the oldest documents belong to the patriarchate of bertolt of andax uh, 1218-1251 right the activity of the patriarchal parliament um, was limited to the approval of new laws and of the financial and military bounties imposed on its members. Uh, in the 14th and 15th centuries, however, a parliamentary council often governed the country alongside the patriarch. The communes did not have full autonomy like elsewhere even though in theory they were still under the, the empires or, or the papacy, depending on which, even Venice at a point. Since uh, at their hand, um, there were always was a patriarchal officer, steward or captain. So what you, what you see in the other Italian communes that uh, start appointing their own officials and they start ruling themselves without any factual uh, interference uh, is not really the case in, in Friuli. Right. But in the bloody struggles that the patriarchate had to sustain with his powerful neighbors, including, for example, the commune of Treviso, and then the Da Camino lordship that takes uh, the, the city over, there is the increasingly important factor um, in Friuli life constituted by the strength of the of the same patriarchal communes, in fact, which 
uh, often helped the patriarch uh, at a time to fight especially against the counts of Gorizia uh, or against even the dukes of Austria who found more support in feudalism as it was normal in Germany where the communes didn't really have the same factual autonomy that that the Italian ones had uh, instead acquired um, and so there was a specific political institutional balance within the patriarchate of Aquileia that was yes was effectively um, an imperial vassal um, and it maintained an important international standard in that sense the worst as we will see differences regarding the various patriarchs it could change these were elected uh, and so sometimes they were wealth even not just ghibelline but at, at some point it could even be useful for the emperors especially after the the great interregnum where germany splits itself in in v different various um you know uh, princely states that sometimes are either wealth or, or ghibelline and um, at the same time there are communes within it that are not so developed but still are useful to counter the expansion of the nobiliar houses the feudal ones that always try to take over the communes right and this is similar to other parts of Italy especially after the say during the 14th century where um, the the communes were in crisis and so the uh, the the rural aristocracy we also made a video about that tended to gemonize power in them as um, as lords as a matter of fact in that sense eroding the traditional patriarchal uh, government on the cities um, and there was again a, a major tone and authority set by the patriarch itself i mean it was so traditional and um you know uh, juridically recognized that the patriarch had that set of powers and prerogatives that were imperially recognized that um at a, at a point was a few that could be done even to eradicate certain uh certain you know practices certain bonds aside from the erosion that th this would undergone also because the the patriarchate especially by the 14th century was in in serious financial troubles uh, and this um, of course didn't help um, let's say the, the process of preservation of, uh, of the same patriarchal power uh, that had to subcount subcontract in, in essentially to sell its own rights and prerogatives to part of these feudal lords that were backed for example by the Habsburgs by some other important uh, princely uh, lineages and so on and all this in the terrible struggle that we don't even enter in today between Hungary Venice uh, again the Habsburgs the Vittas backs the the Welsh the Ghibellines um, and all at a point even the, the religious issues with the great schism and so on so very complicated stories and that's why we have to go really step by step because covering it in a single video is, would be would be madness really and it wouldn't follow <laughs> you know um, even if I were actually speaking more effect right um, there is yet uh, and there are different centers emerging uh, for example Udine Udine is another is a commune Right, uh, a city founded by the patriarch Bertolt of Andex in the 13th century, endowed with large uh, fr franchises, um, acqu which acquires ever greater power among the, uh, the various Friulan communes. So much it becomes a favorite center of trade and the seat of many Tuscan bankers that were expanding in the area uh, financially. However, Cividale remains the most important political and commercial center of the world Friuli, rivaling from the 13th century onwards with Udine, which uh, was also strongly growing thanks to perhaps a, to a more congenial geographical position, but that's surely not the thing. 
um, and considered that the patriarch Bertolt of Andex Merania in 1238 had transferred his own court there and built a superb residence for himself and his successors in Udine. And the city thus so the rise of monasteries, convents, palaces, towers, the most important um, parliamentary uh, houses of Friuli settled there as well, um, and uh, equally dignified ones flourished accordingly. It was a you know an important move um, that caused an enormous rivalry between Cividale and, and Udine, as you understand. Um, and Cividale became especially the protagonist of the Friuland infighting, during which the city was often allied with the Counts of Gorizia, right, and the noble castellans against Udine. Consider that Friuli had lots of castles, right, that the importance of the nobility was greater compared to other areas of Italy. It was a, a more feudal culture, was a more aristocratic culture, uh, the cities were weaker, and so if you had lots of castles in the countryside you could really control a lot. In fact, the Saint Patrick at a point embarks himself in important military expeditions storming ca designed to storm castles mostly, and there are very uh, brutal clashes that take place and um, the naturally also the resistance of these houses normally is is lower because the fact that they were um, let's say they were more powerful than the communes means that you know even the entire region didn't have much resources to make the communes devil so at the end of the day the patriarchate was was the biggest lordship and managed to exhaust relatively uh, quicker the resources of its contendants. Uh, the wars are more contained. Uh, it's not that they are less brutal, but we are counting less, say, smaller armies than the rest of Italy, for example. So it, it, it has less kinetic energy, but still it's interesting to watch and how especially the cities were battle on um, as they could, for example, just more be more easily penetrated. What would Lombardy or Tuscany would take, you know, sieges of you know against this massive for you know city rings with tens of thousands of soldiers are not to be found in Friuli. You have mostly bands of noblemen that literally arrive while I don't know uh, the the people of the city is taking a nap after, uh, after lunch and they they, they launch assaults in this um, towns fundamentally that are eas more easily penetrated and uh, again the clashes are brutal but they're much more individual at the point and it's uh, it's it's a lot more reminiscent of a especially with southeastern german reality right but still actually more advanced than that specific one udine will thus assume ever greater importance becoming over time the institutional capital of friuli Right, uh, too much favor given by the patriarch Bertrand of Saint Genesius, ruling between 1323 and 1350, to Udine triggered the old Friuland capital Cividale. As we've seen, Cividale had initially been faithful to the, the patriarchate and it embodied itself kind of the best of the, the communal tradition. But when they saw that Udine was becoming the, was stealing essentially its place, they betrayed the same communal mentality, right? They preferred to ally themselves with the Counts of Gorizia and, and, and other vassals, as we've seen. So the nobiliar kind of rural, if we can't say, power, backed often by also the, the Habsburgs, to erode instead this kind of more city-based patriarchal power, right? So even the flexibility uh, that uh, this switch entails shows you how, you know, more easily like a center could, could decline compared to one of new foundations, which would have been more difficult in a country of older and more intense urbanization, let's say. 
and a sworn league was made in fact on uh, the uh, bringing on june the 6th 1350 the patriarch who was returning from padua to be killed in saint george of the Rikin belda near the tagliamento river ford um, the again the, the patriarchs were quite warlike themselves some went participating in the wars in Lombardy sieges battles they, they were heavily involved this assassination speaks uh, open for the degree of you know, kind of decadence that also the St. Patrickate and in Friuli in general had undergone because of this strife right we are exactly in the mid 14th century so this is the moment of greatest contraction of power and of shrinking of demographic and economical resources so you have this disgregative process and uh, very often the patriarchate uh, was out of money at this point thus there was not much that could be done telling the truth and Bertrand's successor Nicholas of Luxembourg carried out a bloody repression uh, also against the uh, the assassins in 1353 the Emperor Charles IV intervened, granting Cividale the opening of a university that conferred power, as we've seen, to this kind of anti-patriarchal fashion. Because at this point, again, also the, um, the, the emperors were more or less like the high medieval times are over. So they do mostly not, there is not a single empire, let's say there is an imperial authority in theory, but in practice, it's all fragmented. So all these various houses are are actually competing with one another. Same uh, Luxembourg here is um, is actually reestablishing an important patriarchal power because it was the same imperial interest. It was the same house of Luxembourg to do so. But at the same time, he grants. Uh, uh, the Civitale also to have a university. In, in the same century the city was theater of various disputes by the way between the city and the castle families as well which is, was another theme going on because yes you could again go against uh, the uh, the rival city but how much did that cost right what kind of allies uh, did, you, did, you, did you get in the process what did you owe them to do it so um, the cities wanted to maintain their own autonomy, their self-government. But at the same time, it was very difficult to do it when there were all these hoax circling all around, trying to seize control as lords of the same city. Patriarch Markart of Randek, ruling between 1365 and 1381, collected all the laws previously enacted in the Constitutiones Patriae Fori Iuli, it is the constitutions of the fatherland of Friuli, um, the main provisions of the ecclesiastical principality in an effort of uh, administrative reform, right, to rationalize uh, the administration and functionalize uh, tax collection. And so this is the phase of, gradual phase of remount coming back in the second half of the 14th century after the crisis where these powers tried to compact right to, to maintain also at a point a more autocratic rule but still more you know a more unitary one after the crisis where people simply will give you that power because they're exhausted um, the last 40 years of the patriarchate was a continuation of unrest and in internal struggles anyway uh, on the death of the patriarch Markard Pope Urban VI gave, as it was custom to those times, the patriarchate in commendation to the French prince and cardinal Philip of Alençon, um, various, for various reasons that now we can't digress on, but naturally the papacy uh, was expressing, of course, more Guelph interest, and so the French connection there was relevant, and this shows how naturally the same patriarchal see could be fundamentally both could be played with uh, you know as any other fundamentally but still with with an important and unusual interference there naturally here we are also skipping all the patriarchal relations with the papacy were very complex etc so again there is really a lot we have to talk about it's, it's 
it's too much. Uh, we need ar many other videos on this topic. Um, but uh, the Alençon appointment caused very serious discord, predictably, in Friuli. And the jealousy between Udin and Cividale, the, the, the first that was adverse to Alençon, the second favorable instead, uh, the latter probably because it's so like an, an actual weakening of the former patriarchal rule on Friuli, formed two large parties that essentially kept fighting until the fall of the patriarchal government. And that was also an important um, cause of the say. And the Udinese and their leaders, the very powerful um, Savornian vassals, uh, who exercised uh, a real lordship in the city relied on the Republic of Venice that was already at this point uh, you know preparing its expansion uh, in the uh, in the terra firma at least was ever more involved in it anyway it had already you know stepped in in the first half of 14th century to protect its salt mines against the the Veronese etc and so there was a major uh, financial power, of course, and pressure exercised in this kind of more, this kind of poor feudal areas. Considered that this is uh, in the second half of the 14th century, the moment in which, because of the crisis of the Provencal routes of the Rhone Valley, the Venice strengthened the uh, uh, and also the general intercontinental trade uh, altogether. The territorial uh, routes, the continental routes, especially between Venice and Bavaria. That's why the, there is the Fondac of the Germans in Venice, it dates back to those times, and Friuli just stands in the way. So it was obvious that the Venetians would somewhat try to to Germanize Friulian policy already, even though uh, it was an imperial land, right? So they backed specifically the um, the Udinese in this sense as actually trying to maintain uh, an influence on a pre-existing institution that wouldn't um, wouldn't crumble so that the pro-imperial vassals would kind of uh, root into an area where they probably would have had to intervene and so would have brought Venice against the empire. Um, the opposing party was headed instead by the Carrara lords of Padua and the king of Hungary, their protector that were adverse to Venetian expansionism. Naturally, Hungary had all the matter of Tsar and the Dalmatian coast with the Venetians, and um, Padua was just a major, you know, it was an important signatory at the time that, however, was becoming ever more fragile. And so these are all the moments in which realized the Venetians uh, are ever more pressured to go against their their maritime instinct and starting becoming more more amphibious at least um, to intervene in this in these realities and um, uh, there is also the matter of the the La Scala here but say let's not digress in fact this contrast this is important for Friuli, culminated in the killing of Federico Savornian, which took place by the partisans of the patriarch John of Moravia, was successor of Philip of Alençon. Um, so, important blow for Venice. The, the death avenged uh, by Tristano Savornian, son of the martyr, uh, with the killing of the same patriarch, again on October the 13th, 1394, exacerbated uh, further the, the spirits. In fact, such disputes would never end from there on, and the I mean, and and the Udinese party had the upper hand anyway during the patriarchy of Antonio Pancera, ruling between 1403-1411. This tells you again how. Um, say kind of less stable the same pattern Kate was um, for being let's say hegemonized intermittently by different parties right so this meant that it had compared to the time of you know of the great 
vassal entity it had grown um, weaker, more exposed even to groups that were more strictly local and thus um, you know showing kind of the provincialization of the same patriarchy by a certain degree um, and at this point um, Sigismund of Hungary that see things turning instead well well for Venice stepped in uh, and he had freely occupied by his army obtaining from the Pope in the process the appointment of a patriarch who adhered to him that was the Duke Ludwig of Tech. Um, so Venice and the Savornian with their adherents uh, simply went at war and on July the 13th 1419 Cividale made a dedication to Venice uh, so to say that it was under her signory and with some um, other communes and feudal lords of Friuli too. So on June the 16th 1420 Udine also capitulated and Tristano Savornian solemnly returned in the city carrying the banner of St. Mark himself um, the big deal Cividale was the first to give itself to the Serenissima stipulating a solemn peace and a contextual alliance and in the following decades some nobles planned to open the doors uh, the gates to the ousted patriarch Ludwig of Tech who was still uh, aiming at coming back and in fact uh, returned in 1431 at the head of 4,000 Hungarians again remember the the Alpine Pass is just in the east uh, that, that's where they normally float but it had already happened right Friuli was devastated at some point in the early 14th century a massive army sent by the Count of the Council of Gorizia to to interfere in the Veronese Paduan affairs I mean a big big armies by the way we're talking about again tens of thousands of these raiders horse archers that are documented and must still speaking the language of the steppe as you understand in that context in spite of being relatively late medievally speaking um, anyhow Ludwig failed to achieve anything substantial so this uh, event that ended up with the Venetian victory in Friuli concluded the experience of the Patriarchate of Aquileia as an autonomous state entity albeit still linked to the Holy Roman Empire because again um, this was kind of just of uh, the addition meaning um, you know if you were an imperial vassal you could say ask for a non-imperial power to protect you right especially if you know the ideal was that if the Emperor couldn't protect you you could simply you should protect yourself because at that point the Empire comes 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 less right it's delegitimized in that uh, context but factually, like at this point, of course, Friuli was not, say, annexated to Venice. Right? It was just ruled uh, in different ways. That, of course, also Venice at, at a point um, administered by usurping some imperial rights. But like, it never was like a non-imperial land. And there is an enormously important um, field, in fact, especially late medieval and early modern history, which must still be studied regarding act the survival of the Guelph Ghibelline struggle among these various um, especially yeah in areas like the northeast of Italy also in Piedmont from the other side um, because these were more feudal in nature than the rest of Italy and, and Israel mostly says well, I'm, you know Guelph and Ghibelline is, was just like um, you know an ideal thing to, instead if you actually dig even as late as the wars of Italy, um, the time Maximilian also had marched into the peninsula, etc. You realize that there was a net of noblemen, of aristocrats, that were imperial vassals that actually were incredibly well connected. You you find them like having offices in Germany, like ha this being maybe just merchants that had covered important roles in the, at the imperial court and then marrying into important German nobility and then coming back to Italy because they had the possessions there with increased feudal uh, imperial feudal prerogatives 
and it's a, like a universe that uh, is not really much studied for some reason and I have the fortune of having a dear colleague of mine who studies exactly this kind of uh, background and it's it's um, uh, I'm relatively similar because I also study mostly uh, Italian and German history so I'm very ghibelline in many ways as the Holy Roman Empire is my focus and I'm very fascinated with dynamics here um, in any case freely yeah it, it's a protagonistic land in this regard or at least you know more secondary one but an overlooked one unfairly overlooked one now the political domination of the Aquilean church however was over like this the Venetian period in the history of Friuli began and it this was last until 1797 um, the ecclesiastical entity itself will survive until 1751 um, the autonomous county of Gorizia and the free commune of Trieste also um, following uh, their essentially the, their betrayal the, the betrayal of their military commanders corrupted by the Habsburgs respectively uh, Birkel von Graben for Gorizia in 1500 and Nikola Lugar in uh, De La Llama in Trieste in 1468 um, brought the centers to pass under the imperial domination and fundamentally they would until 1915 right this is yet another chapter about the you know a world that doesn't exist anymore but is still very close to us temporarily and was the one of when the middle ages still existed like before the end of world war the first were uh, such uh, ethnic issues and also a different meaning from today where empires had kind of had been maintaining a properly a, a different idea of even what ethnicity really meant right but that's an interesting story we could make another time and there was an attempt to bring back even the sea of the patriarchate of Aquileia back to Cividad at the point but in vain right uh, with the exception of Niccolò Donà in 1497 this was a Venetian that attempted fact the to to restore the older tradition let's say and as we've seen it was a historically mobile see um, concluding this like the, the long period following this it was mostly peaceful except for two fact wars that must be remembered namely one is the uh, actually the famous one of Cambrai that took place was fought in fact in Friuli as well the other one was the war of Gradisca and both of them were caused by the attempts made b by the Venetians to unify Friuli because and especially adding uh, Gorizia to their possessions the county of Gorizia so the th that was a, an imperial land so Friuli had remained still again mostly hegemonized by the Venetians but not completely so there were imperial vassals still there um, and Leonard the last count of Gorizia died in 1500 so Venice claimed that the thief fell naturally to St. Mark why because um, this was Venice had been the successor of the Aquilean church or at least was its own you know lord in some way so the protection passed or even properly the occupation to to it I don't know what are the specifics but um, they're these are delicate ones I, I suspect in any in any case um, Venice occupied Gorizia Gradisca Cormons the lower Isonzo and the uh, and the Covales as well as the various possessions of the counts in Friuli so the result was the famous war between the Emperor Maximilian of Habsburg and the uh, Republic so this was the League of, of Cambrai better known and um, which is also a very complicated story and much bigger one in scale as you know but Friuli was an important theater of it the ups and downs of the war led essentially to two occupations of the country by the Imperials um, and in the first one the value of Cividale is shown uh, talking about 1509 
um, as the city resisted the assaults of the imperial army under the Duke Heinrich the Seventh of Brunswick, um, and that of the of Benzone, this is another town, who uh, against uh, the imperials held the uh, um, the lock, uh, the the fella lock. And in the, in the second siege, sustained by Girolamo Savornian, you see always the Savornian faithful to Venice, in the fortress of Osopo is, is particularly famous because this resistance against the German army allowed the Venetians to arrive and defeat uh, the Imperials uh, in the Battle of Pordenone. Right? So most, most battles of the time were fought, right? somebody trying to break a siege. Um, and um, around 1530, um, the, uh, the, there was, however, the loss of the Gastaldi of Tolmino and uh, the annexed uh, Mercury mines of Idria. They were an important asset, and this decreed an inexorable economical decline, as well as somewhat geographical marginalization, later roads which never had the opportunity to recover in the area. Also, in perspective, Venice was unable to annex the Gorician lands and was barely able to preserve the ancient possessions. Right? The same fate had the War of Gradisca, which broke out in 1616. We are in very different time, and this had been triggered also by the famous, um, you know, um, in fact, the Slavic Uskox piracy. Uh, this was Croatian corsairs who sacked the Venetian ships, and the war took place around the Austrian fortress of Gradisca. It was skillfully defended by the Gorician noble Richard of Strassold. And despite many warlike actions carried out in the Karst and uh, in the Zonso Valley, the Venetians did not come um, at the head of Austrian resistance. The war ended the, in 1617 and the borders remain unchanged, right? Um, and um, there is a broader understanding that in, in the Austrian, so the Archducal at that point lands, feudal rights had undergone by that point a significant attenuation, right? The colonists were treated better, they were less taxed, they had less duties. So by the end of the 16th century, it was um, a, a profound gap that had been formed between what was objectively perceived as a Venetian despotism from one side and a good Austrian government from the other. Um, and this opens to the other considerations we were making before regarding the fact that these lands were uh, essentially remaining within the Habsburgic Empire for, for a long time. Right? Uh, these were not present at the the time of the Italian unification, because they were uh, just, uh, you know, that would be accomplished in theory, just with, in fact, incorporation of the same, and not even of this one entirely up to World War the First, right? Because the, the 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 area mostly falls under Italian control, uh, the the kingdom Italy control, with the um, with the so-called, um, at least from the Italian side, the Third War of Independence. In 1866, the one which they were allied with the Prussians and so on. Um, but there are, uh, the objectively, freely does, um, let's say, represent a, a legacy of that past, a legacy of that Habsburgic um, tradition that by, by many was felt, in fact, even as, uh, you know, a more, a more rightful one, um, in spite of the fact that these were Romance-speaking areas, albeit uh, uh, not Italian or depending on, because in the modern identity there is this issue: like is Friul and Italian, right? And and well, most people would say yes, right? Uh, at least for what Italian means today. Well, in maybe in, in times like 1866, uh, and lots of things happened in between. Maybe it was n was not really the case, but um, I personally a fan of, uh, let's say, of um, unitary statehood, and but at the same time also feder federative power among the same larger countries. So I'm not for coming backs, um, reversing history, kind of like that at all, right? 
But I think that history is also about being aware that um, understanding of things change, like in ways that is natural too, and that we're not habituated to reason like, but not because thinking of those times there is also somewhat is also somewhat irrelevant. I mean, considering what what is happening today in the world, like these issues come long after many others. It's just that they can help uh, make his, making us understand what, what, what it means today. And again, this is not meant in an anti kind of grouping, uh, in fact, unifying tradition. On the contrary, I, for example, am a strong advocate for Euro the European unity. And, and I'm pretty triggered when people say, well, you know, but Europe makes mistakes, so there shouldn't be a, a, a united Europe. Do you have an idea of, of what, like, by scale of what you're saying like you know even if there were mistakes and there are and some are pretty serious ones like all what we have built and spent to make europe uh, and which largely functions by the way contrarily to what people to iconoclasts and people that just have no dimension of this phenomena uh, the most uh, the least educated the most illiterate to say want to make you believe uh it's just like you know uh, there is, you see, there is. I think there is no human dignity in destruction. This is what I believe, and I've come to believe, historically speaking, is that understanding how things are built, even in in the in worse aspects, has nothing to do with what eventually these things give you back later on when they are already there. You can learn to fix because they did bring to some kind of greater effectiveness in awareness. And on. May not be even the specifics of that reality, but the general expansion of the world that influenced it, yeah, for the better, but still, right, there are some things that you must be able to, if you just use simple dichotomies, like, you know, this was older, so it was better, uh, I think you haven't understood exactly what even those people believed at that time, because they, they absolutely understood the thing differently. I mean, the reason why it was better, because they realized that there's never, there's always a double thread, reality it's never like or either black or white which is instead what you are thinking and what you don't see and you can't see so i presume this is one of the single most important um, um you know conclusions you can draw and today we just talked about this part let's say of uh, this european region but let's say it's probably really for everywhere yeah, in every time right um in any case, we will keep talking about Freeland history at some uh, other level, right? Like we did randomly last spring, etc. These videos are m a bit more aimed, but um, there's really a lot to, to explain about the, the various history, especially the 13th to 14th century one is quite intense, right? As you realize that was the peak of medieval civilization, more things happened, but then. Um, things tend to contract. In any case, um, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.